All right, we're heading into exam week uh, in Chemistry 211 and another homework assignment here that can help you prepare. This one uh, I think was a little bit tougher for some of you and so I thought we'd do another one of these video answer keys and help you get some last minute problem solving tips on your way to Friday's exam. So let's just go ahead and dive right in. First one a lot of you struggled with, this idea of uh, calculating enthalpy with bonds breaking and bonds forming was something you probably haven't done uh, since way back in 111. So I thought we'd sort of dust off the cobwebs and think about this, right? And so here you've got a reaction. And the first thing that I, I would urge you to do when you, you work on these kinds of problems with bond uh, breaking and bond forming is to, to really think about what do you have in terms of reactants and products. So we start with uh, two moles of hydrogen gas, right? That's diatomic, uh, trivial uh, structure here. And then we've got some uh, diatomic oxygen there and so that's double bound uh, oxygen so there we go our little lone pairs there and this is going to convert to uh, two moles of water and so I'll draw my water structure here uh, again really simple nothing challenging here remember there are two moles of water produced so we'll go ahead and draw two of those and what we want to do now is we've got a, our table over here of bond dissociation energies and that's really important. You'll notice that when you break bonds that that's an energy penalty, right? To break a hydrogen-hydrogen bond that's going to cost you an energy penalty of 436 uh, kilojoules per mole. To break the double bond here you've got this value here. And then when we form the four, and this is really important, right? We've got four of these OH bonds or uh, written here in HO bond, same difference, uh, you're going to form these bonds and every time you form one that's an energy uh, that's liberated or released, right? So when bonds break you have to put energy in to break them and when they form energy is released, right? That's why bonds form. We're going to a lower energy state so energy is released and you get a whopping uh, 460 kilojoules per mole and so let's go ahead and calculate this right so a lot of you are wrong you don't just memorize products versus reactants you gotta think about what's actually going on here that was a when you use heats of formation that's very different than when you're using bond energies and so we look at the penalty right to break the bonds here that's a penalty right and so that's going to be um, a, a positive value so let's go ahead and write that down so we know what to expect and we're going to say that we're going to sum all this up we know that we have two moles of our um, HH bonds right and that's if we look at the table we know that's 436 kilojoules per mole and then we're going to add that to the energy required to break that nice uh, oxygen double bond so that's one mole right and then uh, the energy penalty there is 498 kilojoules per mole all right so that's our penalty right I'm required to break that and so we're just going to add that to uh, what we get when we form the bonds and so when you form the bonds we know that's going to be energy release so it's going to be negative right so let's go ahead and sum that up right we're going to get four moles of the HO bond that are being formed and here we go for this one we get a, a nice 460 kilojoules that we just discussed right throw that in there you add the you add all this together and in this case uh, you might say oh wait a minute Dr. Porter you told me that you're forming a bond uh, forming four bonds so why isn't that negative well in this case we can just flip the sign right if you're forming a bond, 460 kilojoules per mole is not being absorbed, it's being released. So we can say that's a negative value there. We add that together. And in this case, I think I get something like negative 470 kilojoules for the reaction as written. And so there we can see here um, that the overall reaction, right, if this is our, our delta H of reaction, we should notice then that is exothermic as indicated by the negative sign. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one, next part of the question rather. So the next part says, well wait a minute, uh, explain the molecular origin. So what does that mean? That just means explain at the micro scale, right? The atoms and molecules scale here. So why? what's the molecular origin of being exothermic? Well you can look back at the equation. You can say, okay, well there's an energy penalty associated with breaking bonds 
So that means if you look at the summation of all this versus the energy that's liberated or released when you form bonds, you can see which one kind of wins the tug of war here. We pay a cost or a penalty to break bonds, but if you notice here, we broke three bonds, and so, you know, especially the 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 HH bonds here, they're a little weaker at three at 430. Uh, granted, the double bond oxygen is, is a little bit stronger, but over here, we formed four, I would say, pretty strong bonds. And so we broke three bonds, maybe overall, that were uh, a little bit maybe weaker, or just in total, the energy penalty we paid is lower than the energy that we get back when we form bonds. And so here you can say that uh, the energy released or the heat released when you uh, form bonds, right, that negative value here is in this case larger than the energy required when we break those bonds. And some of you are really good about this. You said, okay, well this HH bond is a little weaker. There's only two of those and we broke one is a little bit stronger. So overall we got three bonds being broken four bonds, uh, pretty strong bonds being formed, so in this case our, our negative value um, ends up winning the tug of war and we have a little bit, uh, uh, not, not so little, I mean negative 470 kilojoules is not bad, but exothermic overall. Now predict the sign of the change of entropy for the reaction. Well that's pretty simple too, we just come down here and we say okay well let's look at the reaction way up here at the top, back up here, we've got one, two, I see two plus implied one there, we have three moles, right, so three moles of gas going to, oh wait a minute, there, oh yeah, there's there are no moles of gas over here, so zero moles of gas in the product, so if you go from reactants to products, we're going from three, you know, gases are the most disordered uh, state of matter that we really discussed in common use, so three moles of gas going to no gas, that's definitely going to be a pretty big decrease in disorder, so we can say then that the change in entropy for this reaction, if we're only looking at the sign, is going to be negative. Alright, that's not so hard. So go back and review that one if you had a hard time thinking about that. This next one's kind of fun. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever watched the Myth Mythbuster show, but it's in its last season, and I always found it pretty entertaining. And so, if you want to see the the episode that's connected to this problem, you're welcome to to go check that out on your time. But maybe do it after the exam because you need to work on that exam prep right now. So this is a fun little myth they did, where if you have a, a piece of buttered toast, buttered on only one side, and you drop it off the table. You know, the myth states that, you know, the, the butter side typically falls down um, more often than not. But, you know, uh, you can go check that out. But here you see it's a fun little example. What we're saying is this is really no different than a coin like we talked about in class or those little carbon monoxide molecules we treated like coins. And you can say that each one has one uh, of two outcomes. It can land butter side down or butter side up, and it doesn't really matter. But we can calculate this, right? And so, a couple ways you can do it. Uh, I typically say I love to calculate the number of states, which Boltzmann uh, called a W, um, and so the total number would be uh, two, because there are two states, 100 tosses of a coin or 100 slices of toast, uh, and I get something like the total possible would be, oh, what is this? I get 1.27 times, oh, I think it's something like 10 to the 30th, right? So a lot of different uh, states there, and if you want to think about the probability of um, all those 100 slices landing, say, butter side down, that would be our perfectly ordered state if we're thinking about it in terms of entropy terms. Well, there's only one of those states that's perfectly ordered where all the toast uh, falls with the butter side down, so I'd be one in quite a large number, right? So um, I don't put much uh, stock into that myth, especially with this calculation, so it's not very probable. And then you can go down here and treat it uh, the way Boltzmann might treat it. And so you can say, okay, we can calculate the entropy of one of the uh, disordered states, right? We can calculate that is equal to uh, the good old Boltzmann constant uh, times natural log of the number of states. Well, that's pretty easy. We can look up Boltzmann constant, Boltzmann constant, which is up at the top, right? Um, it's 1.381. That's enough. Uh, 
decimal places for right now, times, remember, Boltzmann's constant is a very small number, right? Joules per Kelvin. And we're going to multiply that by uh, natural log of the number of ways, which we set up above, is 2 to the hundredth. You can play around with your log, natural log rules there, and it becomes an even simpler one. But for one of those uh, disordered states, I get something like uh, 9.57 times 10 to the negative 22nd joules per Kelvin, which means that if our butter side down perfectly ordered state is zero, uh, the um, entropy change in going from uh, you know that ordered state which is zero to this would be a, a net increase in entropy of this value 9.57 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin. So pretty sim simple uh, one there, uh, kind of a fun little problem. All right, let's get into something that is more classic to what we've been talking about in class and some of you are still having a little bit of trouble with these uh, PV expansion and compression cycles and problems so let's let's just take this from the, the very uh, top here and so I've got our first indicator diagram and remember indicator, di indicator diagrams are always P external right and I'm just gonna say we're gonna measure that in ATM always put a unit that's just really important our x-axis is always gonna be volume and we've got step one here what do we got we got a monoatomic ideal gas that is really important isothermal against a constant atmospheric pressure so you know this is um, isothermal right delta T equals zero and for a monoatomic gas that has some really important consequences we'll talk about in a minute we don't get a lot of information here in terms of pressure and volume and number of moles and that's something to look out for but here in this problem I'm not even looking for a, a, any real calculations but we'll say we start at um, you know uh, V initial and we're gonna go to some state V final right and if you plot this out you can say okay well you're uh, expanding against the con constant atmospheric pressure so that is irreversible expansion right that's really important and we're going in this direction here kind of like in the last homework assignment and the area under the curve is the work done right so if you were going to solve that that would be work system equals uh, what, negative P external times Delta V very 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 simple right that that's no big deal and so uh, the trick over here though is that you've got to be careful to to think about what's actually happening here so you got expansion and then that's that's how you plot it there. Here's our path, and the integral is actually rather rather trivial, right? Well, over here though, we have a little bit. Oh, and it's oh, I, I need to go back here. I, I was not careful, and I need to put my my pressure there just just to put it there. It's really important to keep track of things. Again, we're not doing any numerical value calculations here, but to have it all complete, um, you know, looks nice and tidy. And man, if it isn't uh, helpful to get you solving those problems. Okay. Anyway, I digress. So let's just jump over here then. So our second step, we've got P external. And I'm going to go ahead and give me some units over there. I'm going to give you my volume and liters. And again, we'll say we've got, in this case, we're, we're, going to, we're going to compress it, right? So we're going to have our V initial over here. And our V initial, right, we start out over here. And in this case, we're going to compress it back to its initial. And its initial was over here at 5 ATM. And remember, this is really important. Again, it's an, the same ideal gas, isothermal, but this is so important. I can't circle this as many times as I wish I could. Uh, reversible is really important because that is um, a very, very special path, right? That is the path that gives you um, the actual PV relationship, right? Uh, reversible means that we're at equilibrium. We're using infinitely small steps, right? And that's really critical here. And so if you look at this one, boom, you calculate the work under the curve, and that's that's equal to the work of the system, right? And that's that's a reversible. And I'm gonna actually irritate you by making you go back to your notes and looking that formula up. So you actually internalize it a little bit more, because that's the one that's a little bit trickier. And I'm not gonna do the integral derivation right here on this uh, handout because our we're already at a few minutes and I want to keep this reasonably short. So go back to your notes and if you're going to calculate reversible, uh, work for the reversible path, you need to go and, and take a look at that. But let's go ahead and jump back to the bottom here and this is really important. All right, so 
we're looking at the internal energy change, right, for step one. Well, we know that this is um, isothermal. We have delta T, right, equals zero, and that's really important. And then in this case, we know that this is um, monoatomic ideal gas. And remember, that's really important because for a monoatomic ideal gas at isothermal conditions, I don't know what's going on with my pen here, um, looks pretty bad, I apologize, but whenever you have a monoatomic ideal gas and it's under an isothermal condition, you have to remember back to your definitions, right? In this case, you have to think, okay, well, our definition temperature relates to uh, measure the average translational kinetic energy, and for a monoatomic ideal gas, that is the only source of internal energy. So if the temperature doesn't change, the average translational kinetic energy does not change, and that means your internal energy does not change. And so that gives us a big old zero here. We're still working with a monoatomic ideal gas at isothermal conditions for step two. So for the same reason, it's equal to zero. And then I love this last one. You guys know that I love uh, state functions. And so a uh, state function will tell you, right, that I only care about where I started and where I end up. And if this is a cycle, a complete cycle, I end up where I started. And if that's the case, um, I have not done any change. And so that goes to zero. Really, really, really simple there. All right. We get a little bit tougher here on some of these other ones, right? And so we need to think about what's going on here. If you think about work for the step one, right? Well, that's that's not hard to think about. We don't even need any of the math, right? That's simply expansion work. And if my system is expanding, it's doing work on the surroundings, which means that its energy to do work in the future is diminished. So that means it's a, a release of energy in the form of work. So the work system is negative. By contrast, we're doing a compression, right? Compression in step uh, two. So if it's compressing, it's kind of like loading a spring. The surroundings are doing the work on the system. So that means we're uh, putting energy in in the form of work, so that's gonna be positive. Now, if you go back up to the top, you see that the area under the curve for the work in the reversible step is much larger than in the uh, the irreversible expansion and so the area for step two is larger. Step two is um, you know we can say here that the work of the system in step one is going to be less than and remember the first one is negative right is less than the work of the system in step two right that's important and that was a positive so that means in this case if the positive is higher there we go all right, now we gotta be careful over here. Now we're going to heat, right? Well, we know then that we said that delta U, right, for the system uh, is equal to zero. And we that's because, again, the monoatomic ideal gas. I can't harp enough on the fact that you have to be careful and not just make assumptions, but back them up and tell me why you're making those assumptions. Monoatomic ideal gas, isothermal conditions, boom, that's gonna be zero. And by the first law, uh, that means that it's equal to the Q of the system plus the work of the system, which again, like the last homework, means that these are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign. So if step one was uh, work was negative, that means the heat then was positive. And by the same token, right, same argument here for Q for step two, the work of step two was positive, that means the heat of step two is negative. And then for the whole cycle, we remember that step two has a larger magnitude, so we say that overall that whole cycle is going to be negative, right? Really, really important there. Now, this is a kind of neat one. What about the entropy? Well, we talked earlier about kind of probabilistic arguments for entropy, and if we've got a bunch of molecules of gas, that helium gas confined in a small space, and we allow it to expand to take up a larger space, right? That'd be like um, Dr. Porter's messy office. If they gave him a bigger office, he would be able to get take his stuff and throw it all over the office and be even more disorder than it already is. So when you take a certain set of, of molecules and you give them more room to run around, it's hard to keep track of them. So that means that the uh, disorder, right, for that system, the disorder increases positive for expansion. By contrast, the disorder will decrease if you confine those molecules in a smaller place. They're easier to keep track of. The, in the disorder there or the entropy decreases. And again, the last one here, I can't tell you how much 
I love state functions, right? State functions are so important and so useful. So state function, again, only cares about where you started and where you end up. And so if you start and end up at the same place, uh, you haven't done anything. So there's no change. So there you go. All right, we're making progress here. Our last one. OK, stay with me now. Okay, first thing you need to do is take the reaction that we have, and anytime you see a reaction, I just say we need to balance that. And so you see you got one carbon over here, one carbon over there. You got two sulfur here. Oh, we need to put two sulfur there. And then that means we've got, uh, what do we have over here? We got one here, one here. We've got two plus four is six. That means, boom, we need three times molecular oxygen to balance that all out, and that looks good. This is a really simple problem for we want to know the standard heat of formation for this reaction as written. So, oh, look at this. It's so nice. We've got some standard heats of formation given to us. And you might say, oh, where's oxygen? Well, you know I love to say that elements in their standard state, you don't even need to put them on the table. It's so easy. So we take this and we say, okay, well, let's go ahead and do it. Now we can use our products minus reactants equation that you all love so much. And so let's go ahead and dive into that. We've got uh, one mole, right, of carbon dioxide and we can go on the table there and we see that the heat of formation carbon dioxide right is standard heat of formation of carbon dioxide it's 393.5 let's make sure we put those units in there that's really important we're going to add that to our two moles of uh, sulfur dioxide right and we look up sulfur dioxide and I think we get negative 296.9 Again, don't forget those units. You're throwing away points if you don't put those in there. And then we want to do products minus reactants. So we'll sum up all of those nice reactants. I get one mole of uh, yummy carbon disulfide. Oh, that stuff is not fun. Um, you take carbon disulfide and you look it up on the table there and you get negative 117.1 uh, kilojoules per mole. And again, we don't worry about the oxygen at all. So we crank that out on your calculators and remember to get familiar with that nice TI-30 there uh, that's the only calculator we'll allow you to use on the exam I get an exothermic value here that's roughly uh, 870 kilojoules right and I always make sure to think about exothermic or endothermic as I solve these problems we want to look at the change in the standard change of uh, entropy for the reaction. And again, it's the same thing. We do products minus reactants. You guys love that equation. So let's go ahead and crank that out. We've got one mole of our uh, carbon dioxide, right? And we look on the table there, and the standard molar entropy for carbon dioxide, I think, is what? Well, I can't read the table there. One th 213, rather, uh, 0.6. And watch the units here. They're, they're different, right? So moles, Kelvin there on the bottom. And then we take, um, what's our next product there? We've got, again, two moles of sulfur dioxide. And if you look on there, we get, uh, what is that, 248.5 joules per mole Kelvin, right? And that's our, our products. And then we need to subtract the reactants. And now here's where you got to be really careful. Remember fundamental difference between enthalpy and entropy. Enthalpy, heats of formation are, are you know based upon relative values. The oxygen, the elements in their standard states, we assign them. We assign them by convention to be zero. That's our, our reference point, our zero value. But for entropy, entropy, right, delta S, we're looking at standard molar entropies, right? And so those are absolute values. They're relative to uh, zero Kelvin, right? That's so important. All under, uh, under um, undergird by the, the the third law of, of thermodynamics right perfectly ordered crystal at zero Kelvin is zero and so we got to be careful to remember that all right and so here the oxygen is not zero so let's remember that when we get there we got one mole of our uh, carbon disulfide right and that one I think is what 238.0 joules per mole Kelvin and we add that to our what our one mole of oxygen and I get uh, or sorry whoops almost made a mistake there right there's three we gotta watch our watch our balancing right and that's that's a goofy mistake be careful about that and then it's gonna be 205.0 joules per
per mole Kelvin, right? There you go. You get that, and I think I got negative 142 uh, joules per Kelvin. Really important. And so, um, there you go. Uh, next thing we do is we want to know, use the balanced chemical reaction up above to explain the sign of uh, the change of entrop standard entropy for the reaction. Okay, well, that's not so hard, right? Again, the first thing you want to do is look for moles of gas. And so I'm going from, it uh, looks like, four uh, moles of gas, right, to what? I see, I think I see three moles of gas, right? Well, in that case, right, doesn't that kind of, we say we're going from four moles of disordered gas to three moles of disordered gas. That means that I should have uh, a decrease in disorder, right? So I would predict a delta S of reaction, right, a standard state there, of negative. And I do see that in my answer. So that, that makes me happy that my answer has some bearing to uh, reality there. Uh, the last two questions, I think, are really clever. Uh, they get you really thinking about the idea of spontaneity. Um, the first one, you know, will the, will the temperature of the surroundings increase or decrease? Well, and explain, what does that mean? Well, think about it, right? Uh, we calculated a delta H value, right, of reaction, and we said that was exothermic. So where is that heat going, right? That energy in the form of heat must be going from the uh, system, right, to the surroundings, right? Because the universe, as you know, is composed of the system which we're looking at and the surroundings. So if the system kicks out some energy in the terms of in, in the in term in the form of heat to the surroundings, well, that means it's going to get those molecules in the surroundings moving even faster, uh, stir up some disorder. So that's going to give us a positive value then for the delta S of the surroundings. And typically we don't really focus on the surroundings because as chemists, you know, we only care about our objects of affection, which are our systems, and that's really important. But in this case, it's really neat because it feeds directly into this really good question E. It tells you that the burning of that carbon disulfide, which you would never really want to do, pretty nasty stuff, is spon it, it, it rarely burns. It's spontaneous, right? And now that you know, that means we've got a, a negative uh, delta G there, right? Um, in, in this case, we say, okay, well, that happens, right? It's a spontaneous process, but the sign of, of the standard uh, change in entropy for this reaction we saw was, was negative, huh? Well, what does that mean? I, I seem to remember some of you telling me, oh, you have to, a spontaneous process is always uh, giving you uh, increased disorder. And this is where you need to be really careful with the second law, right? The second law states that for a spontaneous process, uh, for an isolated system, uh, entropy is always increasing, right? Well, that isolated system, we know, is the universe. So if we think about the uh, delta S for the universe, right, that's equal to the delta S of our system plus the delta S of our surroundings, right? That's really, really key. And we even talked about this before where, um, so this guy has to be a positive sign, which kind of leads into our discussion the other day about how that has consequences to bring delta G to negative, but we won't worry, that, worry about that right now. We knew that from this problem, delta S of the reaction in the system is negative. However, we just discussed that um, delta S for the surroundings is positive. And if we know that this spontaneous process um, occurs that, well, it's, it's got to lead to um, a positive change in entropy for the universe. Well, that's, that's fine. It doesn't disagree. What we can say then is that the positive change of the increase of entropy in the surroundings overcomes the small decrease in entropy for the system. And so overall, we still get a spontaneous process because the delta S for the universe is positive because this one wins, even though this one's working against us. So not terribly troublesome, but again, it really goes back to our understanding of the second law. So I hope these problems helped. Uh, I noticed my pen is acting a little weird today. I'm gonna try to work on that um, and get my uh, uh, tablet uh, working a little bit better, but I hope this helps you understand what we're doing and perhaps helps you see some of the things you missed when you get these back. And again, just you know, work problems. That's the way you're going to learn. That's the way you're going to get confidence, the way you're going to get to be able to solve these problems quickly um, in an exam environment. We're going to be working lots of problems this week. So please come see me or 
um, the QSC and get help and, and get on this stuff because I, I think you can all do really well on this if you put the time in. All right, catch you next time.